the last words of famous people. Is that something that you've ever Googled or, or maybe have a book of or, or heard through the years? I know it's something that's been interesting to me. Um, I believe there is actually a book published by Christian Publishing House years ago that said all the, fast, all the last words of saints and sinners, and it was several such examples from more uh, past history. But what is it in us that is curious to know the last words of certain people, especially famous folks' names that you would all know? Well, I think it's to think what was on their mind as they knew they were slipping into eternity, as they knew their life was about to end. What was on their mind and heart? What was, you know, where were they? And some such words that I found in looking it up was Bob Marley, the reggae king in the music world. He famously said, money can't buy life. That was his last words to his son standing at his bedside as he breathed his last. True words from Bob, right? Beethoven, another musician from a few years further back, the classical composer. He was known to have said as his last words, a curtain call that was famous at that time of history. He said, friends applaud, the comedy is over. Then he breathed his last. Winston Churchill, a World War II hero in the minds of many, who uh, was pivotal in the victory over the powers of evil in World War II, right before slipping into a coma as a 90-year-old man and then passing away, he said, I am bored with it all. So the last words are very telling, aren't they? For those who um, have the good fortune to have last words and have them recorded. And I want us to look this morning at the last words of someone that we all, I think, hold dear in the faith, and that's the Apostle Paul. Um, He's writing this letter to uh, his protege, Timothy. And so what we get is a window of time here, and I want you to think about, as we read the text this morning, that this was a letter initially. Of course, it's the inspired word of God, but think of it as a letter from a person to a person. Um, Think of it, uh, if it helps, in modern terms as an email or even a text, whatever communication that you would frequently use for those close to you. Think of that, and that's the context where we find this writing from Paul to his protege Timothy today. It's a glimpse between a hero and a younger pastor who considered him his hero. It's a glimpse between a mentor and a mentee, an older man in the faith and a younger man in the faith, And I think that all of you could probably find yourself somewhere in this text. It's not specific to pastors only. It's not specific to men only. It is for all of us as believers in Jesus Christ. And I've titled this message, On Being Faithful. On Being Faithful. And to take you there, can we talk about the setting for a moment? We're in ancient Rome, and that is where Paul is imprisoned, obviously for preaching the gospel. He has been tried, and he knows that his execution um, is just a matter of of time. He knows he will not see the other side of the prison cells until he sees glory. And so he's imprisoned, and he knows that he's drawing near to the end, and he wants to write something. Now, Now, who is he writing to? I think that's important to know. Well, he's writing to someone that he left in charge of the church he planted in Ephesus. Ephesus was part of the Roman Empire at the time. Think of modern-day Turkey, and that's where it is located. At the time, it was a port city. It no longer is because of, through the years, the silt kind of uh, made it, caused it to become inland. But at the time, it was a thriving port city, and the largest, it was the capital of Asia, which was, uh, at that time, the name for the province of Rome that we now consider Turkey. So this was a capital of a province. It was a a major uh, industry and commerce center. It was a major tourist site because one of the wonders of the world was there, a temple to Artemis or Diana, depending on if you were in Greek or Roman myths. And she was the pagan god that they worshipped there. And the temple that they built for her was splendid. It had massive columns, was a wonder to behold on the top of a hill. And people came from all over the empire to see this tourist attraction and worship center. As you can imagine, it was a pretty dark Place The practice of worship involved a lot of uh, sexual deviancy, a lot of prostitution. Uh, she was a goddess of a lot of things, including fertility. So you can imagine 
uh, worshiping her was an excuse to do anything that the carnal flesh wanted to do. Into this culture, and it was also, I thought this was interesting, though it was a Roman city, there was no Roman garrison there. There was no strong military presence there. They were considered a free city in Roman law because of the high level of trust that the emperor had for the city fathers there in Ephesus. They had been worshiping their goddess there for over a thousand years as a Greek nation before they became part of the Roman Empire. And the Romans really considered it uh, a place of pleasure. A lot of them retired there. A lot of the elites in the Roman Empire got vacation homes or retirement homes there. They had famous baths. They had famous gymnasiums. And the last thing I want to point out was they had a famous, uh, a large outdoor amphitheater that would rival the, the size of a, like the Jets Stadium today. It's huge, and it's still there. And there is where they had um, a lot of athletic events, Olympic-style games, and that was a huge part of the culture there. So fitness, um, religion of, of, of the pagan goddess Diana uh, were the two big players. Now, what was interesting about the temple is it was actually the commercial center. It was the bank in town. It's a very wealthy city. And the buying and selling, the investing, the loans, all of it happened at the temple of Artemis. And so what we know from the book of Acts is when Paul shows up there, it's it's really cool the way the Lord went before him because he actually meets 12 disciples of Jesus, um, people who had converted to Christianity in Ephesus. The Lord connects them somehow. And so there's this seminal group of believers there. Paul joins with them. They preach the gospel. And there's an explosion, an explosion of people coming to faith. Over a two years period, it says that the entire province of Asia had heard the gospel within two years. And they're coming to Christ in droves from pagan backgrounds, from Jewish backgrounds, because there was a Jewish presence there as well. And all these folks are coming in to this church and, and being saved. And of course, you can imagine there was a lot of stuff that had to work out of their old lifestyles especially those who had no, uh, no Jewish background. It was a huge leap to jump into this new life of Christ and from the, the godless culture that surrounded them. And so we have this awesome opportunity to see Paul's letters to Timothy, the pastor that he left in charge of this thriving, but in some ways problematic church. What were the problems? Well, the problems were they had a lot of people in the church that wanted to be big eyes and talk to the, all the little yous. And they wanted to spout off Christian versions of heresies that Paul warned Timothy to stand strong against. He said, don't let them in. They had to take care of several deacons and others that were just leading people astray. They had some women that had come in from from pagan backgrounds that were um, doing some crazy things that had to be kind of corralled and taught the way of Christ. Um, There's a lot of drama. So it was, it was, it was, there was this glorious outpouring of God's spirit in the gospel, but there's also this resistance you know, of the enemy uh, letting go of these old strongholds. I think you see it most when Paul, when he was still there, was um, almost uh, attacked and killed, actually, in that amphitheater that we discussed. He was preaching, just to be clear, he was preaching in the amphitheater that seated thousands. Yeah, he was a big deal. Everyone in Ephesus would have known the name of Paul. And the city fathers had to intervene or they would have drug him out and killed him in anger, those who, had been, uh, who were opposed to him. Because what happened is he was affecting the financial center. He was affecting the, the selling and investing in the temple. And so the pagans in charge there were losing a lot of money. They weren't trinket salesmen with little carts in front of the temple that were losing you know, small amounts of money on souvenirs. It was actually, the, the gospel had actually penetrated in such a way that it was, it was financially affecting the temple and the commercial stability of the entire city. Isn't it awesome when God shows up and changes everything? <laughs> he changes everything. He changes the way we spend money. He changes, you know, what, what our priorities are. And so this is what was happening. And um, as Acts re- tells us, and I, I'm just giving you the high summary for time's sake, but... Um, Paul is rescued. The Lord uh, has mercy on him, and he, he does make it out of town alive. But he has appointed, as he goes on his missionary journey, he, he appoints Timothy to be the pastor of this church. Timothy was a younger man. He was half Jewish and half Greek. Uh, his mom 
and grandmother had raised him in the faith. It's, it sounds like he was a believer even before Paul showed up. So um, there's a testimony of Christ in Timothy's young life. I think it's interesting that he was not pure Jew, uh, but was part Jew, part Gentile. I think that was strategic on the Lord's part so that he could minister to a part Jewish, part Gentile congregation. But this is who Timothy was. And he's receiving this letter. He knew, he would have known that Paul's end was near. And so you see a difference between first and second Timothy. And Paul is kind of taking off all the filters and speaking with a lot more warmth and affection. It, it, it is a father and son type missive because he knows what's about to happen. And he wants to pour out his heart to his son in the Lord. And so from there, we're going to jump in to verse 1 of chapter 2. You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong. Another way to say it would be be strengthened. And this is a command for sure. He's telling him, make the choice to be strong. But it's also a blessing, a prayer of blessing over him and saying, may you know the strength of the Lord, my son. But I think it's important to know as we're talking about faithfulness today, that's going to be the theme that we see woven throughout this letter. And that's the message of Paul to Timothy. He's saying, son, if you want to know how to be faithful, listen up. Here's some pointers. And the first step to faithfulness is be strong. Be strong. But how, how is he to be strong in his own strength or willpower? No. In the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The grace that is in Christ Jesus. See, the source of strength, he's saying to his son, is not Timothy. It's Christ and Christ alone. It's not willpower. It's not the study of doctrine. It's not self-improvement efforts, Timothy, that will catapult you forward in faithfulness to God and in leading this church. It is the strength of the power of Jesus alone. In Colossians 1.29, Paul says, For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works in me. And that's what he's referring to here when he says, Be strong, but in the grace of Jesus Christ. There's a strength that comes and resting upon the strength of him alone. And we have to recognize we are weak in order to receive such strength, don't we? So the first thing he says is, be strong, my son. Turn with me to Hebrews 4. As we're talking about the grace of God, I think there's an important um, important passage here. Hebrews 4. Verse 15, let's actually start at 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This echoes Paul's instruction there to say, come boldly to the throne of grace, Timothy. Be strong by going to the throne. Be strong by going repeatedly to the throne of grace and finding the strength that you need. What is the next command that he gives him? If we go back to our text in 2 Timothy. Verse 2 says, And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. He says, take what you've learned from me, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Take this and make sure that you're teaching others. Because Timothy, it's not about you. In the end, we're all, we're all guardians of this message. We're all guardians of this precious gospel of Jesus. We're all indwelt by him and called by him to make sure we pass on this message from him and of him because we will pass off the scene as I'm about to. And you need to be sure that you're passing this torch to others, to faithful men who can teach just as well as you. And he's saying, make sure 
as I am your mentor and I'm passing off the scene, make sure that you become a mentor and that you prepare your mentees for when you pass off the scene. I want to pause there for a minute because it's interesting that the charge of Jesus Christ was not just to pastors, but it was to every disciple. When he, was, when he ascended into heaven, he said, go into all the world and make what? Make disciples. That was to all the men and women gathered there, even the children gathered there at that moment. And so his charge to you and I is the same as we see Paul's to Timothy. Make sure that you are following the steps of someone who is strong in the faith and also that you are passing that faith on to someone. You're never too young to start. You're never too old to start. So I encourage you this morning, if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, make sure that you're operating in the fullness of discipleship, which is passing it on. There is no retirement in the kingdom of God, is there? And so Paul understood this, and he said, everything that I've poured into you from the gospel of Jesus, make sure you pass it on, the torch of this gospel teachings. Now, what does he tell him to pass on specifically? What you have heard from me among many witnesses. This is not a statement of hubris. He's not saying, I am the only coke in the desert. You know, I'm the only one who knows the truth of gospel. No, he's saying, You're hearing a lot of heresies come into your church. And if you ever want to know what the truth is, remember, I've laid it out. Keep it simple. Keep it on the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus came to save sinners, that God so loved the world, he came to save us. But, brothers and sisters, the gospel does not stop there. Let me say that again. The gospel does not stop at salvation. The gospel is to be the an outworking in your daily life and my daily life, a dependence upon the grace and the strength of the power of the Spirit, a continual growing in the doctrines of the faith, a continual experiencing of the victory of Christ over everything that would prevent us from knowing Jesus, a continual outreach and and heart for others that takes us out of the church pews, that takes us out of our homes and takes us to places like the abortion clinic to say, there is a better way. Follow us and find Jesus. This is the outworking of the, do- of the gospel in our daily lives. It cannot be neglected and it cannot be reduced to the powerful and simple message of salvation alone. It's not enough to walk an eye on say a prayer and then to go about doing what we want, is it? That is not the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a surrendered, completely surrendered life to all that Jesus is and a commitment to walk with him every step of the way for the rest of our lives. It is a giving over of what we are and and what we know and a humility to come to him and say, everything that I take for granted is truth. Everything that I take for granted is, is what I should live for and where I should go and how I should live. I lay it down at your cross, Lord Jesus. Here's my life. Take it. Take it. Let the gospel be alive in me. Day in and day out. I love the old hymn, Jesus, keep me near the cross. Why? Because it's that cross that will forever remind us that we're here for him. That the gospel has demands on us. There is obedience that's tied in with walking with Jesus. Amen? He says, pass on what you've heard from me. And brothers and sisters, I have to say something here because it's so heavy on my heart. The gospel of Jesus Christ has never been under more attack from every angle than it is today in our culture. In our culture. You know, we're a recent experiment, as some people would say, you know, our, our, our wonderful country. But we've never seen the darkness come against all that is representative of the gospel more powerfully than we have in recent years and today, right? But let me, let me encourage you with something. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And let me say this. The church of Jesus Christ is to be alive and well and to have a joyful and confident yet humble and selfless testimony in this earth. Brothers and sisters, the evangelical church of North America is not humble, is not selfless, and it is not gospel-centered. I say it with every fiber of my being. And I say that if anything, anything would pull us away from the gospel of Jesus Christ into activism on lesser causes for lesser kingdoms, walk away. 
It is not the gospel. I don't care who's saying it from what pulpit, under what denomination. It is not the gospel if it is not focused on Jesus Christ and his kingdom and advancing his kingdom alone. The days are dark. We cannot lose our voice. We cannot lose our testimony. Fighting these small skirmishes on, in political battles that are far beneath the high calling of the gospel of Jesus. Amen? Amen. There is enough. There is enough going on to sidetrack and sideswipe us without taking our voice and laying it on the altar of public opinion, becoming social media activists for causes that will absolutely hinder us from reaching lost people with the love of Jesus. Be very careful. Walk away from anything that would distract us and and clothe itself in masquerading as the gospel of Jesus that is not. Self-preservation is not the gospel of Jesus. And as he's saying this, he's saying, you have a high calling. You have a high calling. And this message must be preserved. This message specifically. And so, as he's saying, pass it on and teach it to others. There's some, vis- there's some visuals that he gives here, specific metaphors that show him how to do that. And as we go on into verse 3, let's look at the first metaphor. He says, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Um, We don't like to hear that, do we? He says, embrace hardship. And in 1 Timothy 1, he, he tells Timothy in this earlier letter, fight the good fight. And I just want to say this morning, it is a good fight, brothers and sisters. And we're fighting from victory. We're not fighting from a place of defeat. Jesus has already won it. So it is a good fight. Remember that. And and we can keep fighting it. But it does mean we're going to have to endure some hardship as a good soldier of Jesus. So suffer like a good soldier. Here's this instruction number one. And what does this metaphor mean? Well, you know what? I kind of chuckled to think about it because Roman soldier would have been something very, very familiar to Apostle Paul. He's probably, as he or his amanuensis is writing this letter, he's probably sitting there looking across his cell at, at the Roman soldier that's guarding him at that moment. He's saying, suffer like a good soldier. And, you know, I just think of that soldier standing in the doorway guarding his cell. At one point, was even chained to him. Um, And I think, you know, he probably, as a young buck, was all fired up to go and fight for the Empire of Rome. You know, to, to be on the front lines of these battles against all of Rome's enemies and to spread the empire far and wide, to come back a war hero tattered and torn, but, but victorious for Rome in all her glory. And he got the orders to guard this old Jewish dude that's sitting in the cell writing letters. You know? And so he's saying, sometimes we have to suffer like a good soldier. When we enlist in this army of the Lord, it takes us places that sometimes we, we, we may not have predicted, doesn't it? <laughs> and so... Um, wherever the Lord has called you, be a good soldier. It's okay. Our commander in chief knows what he's doing. And faithfulness is the key, right? Faithfulness. Be faithful where we're called. Be faithful where we're called. And the other aspect of this is a bit more serious. Look on into the next verse. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Um, My statements a moment ago, there's so much that will entangle us in petty, time-bound affairs of this life, you know, and, and, and steal our joy and steal our testimony and our witness and distract us from God's calling. And he's saying, don't do it. Don't become distracted by these things. But another visual that I thought from Timothy's vantage point, he's here in Ephesus. And though there was no military garrison there of the, of the Roman uh, military, soldiers came through all the time. It was a port city. And where there's a bunch of soldiers coming through a port city and where there's this temple to, to Artemis, you can imagine what's going on, right? And so he's saying, these soldiers are passing through. And my thought was, Ephesus would be a nice place to settle down, would have been the thought of a lot of those soldiers. Um, 
there was a lot, the, the climate, the, the natural hot springs, the, the gymnasium, the beautiful coastline, the uh, opportunity for wealth if you were Roman. 80% of them were in poverty because they weren't Roman. But if you were, you know, if you were a Roman soldier and played by the rules and climbed the ladder, you could have a decent retirement. And it would have been a good place to settle down. But, you know, those, those, those soldiers came up, they came to harbor, to port. They were there temporarily and then went back out to war or whatever their assignment was. And he's saying, we can't leave the ranks even if we're in these places that we wish we could, we can't leave the ranks of what we're called to do. We can't, uh, you can't be that soldier who walks away from his, his post and um, to pursue his own civilian life. And so there is a hardship that comes with that. And there's, there's, there's choices along the way that you and I each have to make to say, Lord, this is the way you're going. This is the way I could go with my life. And I've got to choose this way. And that's what he's saying to do. It is hard, but endure hardship. And then let's talk about just being a soldier in general. Hmm. My hat's off to, um, I know there's those in this room and, and who are worshiping with us outside who have served the U.S. Armed Forces. And thank God for all of you men and women. I um, messaged two uh, employees of mine yesterday I texted them, they're combat veterans from Afghanistan. Um, and I said, thank you, you know. 20 years ago, there was a very different motivation for our military than there is today. And think of everything, I was thinking of everything my two brothers have been through. Um, they lost many men in their companies from IEDs and other things. And, you know, they carry that for life. And so there is a suffering sometimes that goes with the territory. And there's, life, there's scars that we, we pick up along the way. And um, yeah, it costs us something. It costs us something. And a quote from a World War II war correspondent, I think, says it well. He was traveling with the troops in World War II on, into the front lines and said this. The front line soldier lived for months like an animal, was a veteran in the cruel, fierce world of death. Everything was abnormal and unstable in his life. He was filthy, ate if and when, slept on hard ground without cover. His clothes were greasy and he lived in a constant haze of dust, pestered by flies and heat, moving constantly, deprived all the things that once meant stability, things such as walls, chairs, floors, windows, faucets, shelves, Coca-Colas, and the little matter of knowing that he would go to bed at night in the same place he had left in the morning. The frontline soldier has to harden his inside as well as his outside, or he would crack under the strain. A frontline soldier has to fight everything all the time. Brothers and sisters, there are seasons in our life we may be called to the front line. And I hope that you find encouragement in Paul's Words this morning that endure hardness. It does not mean that we're abandoned by God. It means we're on mission from God. And that it, at times we'll be part of that mission. He said endure hardness. And Paul knew in the spirit and from the culture what Timothy was in for. He said endure it. You are on the front lines, my son, but you can fight this good fight. It mattered that Timothy embraced suffering. Because if he didn't, his own testimony and even the witness of Christ and those he was called to serve could, could be at stake. And so it matters, brothers and sisters, that we do embrace the suffering that God assigns us. It's different for each of us. And, and let me be clear, frontline soldiering is usually for a season. Um, God is not abusive in his call to us. He does not look to punish us when we surrender our lives to him. He looks the exact opposite, to grow and cultivate us and to make us more powerful and mighty in him as individuals than we ever dreamed we could be. But just as the soldiers in the natural 
Sometimes boot camp is required, right? Sometimes front lines are required to build that metal within our soul and to know that in the darkest night, we know the greatest light. We have that song from him. When every, everything threatens to steal our joy and it doesn't disappear because Jesus is ours, we come out with a stronger testimony than we ever dreamed. Amen? Amen. So first he tells them, suffer like a good soldier. It requires focus. It requires embracing suffering when you need to. Endure hardship, Timothy. Verse 5. Also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. He's saying, he's jumping to another metaphor here. He says, you've got to be like a good soldier. you also got to be like a good athlete. How many of you play sports for fun or maybe in the past have played sports professionally or for college? What's the worst thing in sports? It's a cheater, Right? <laughs> I didn't hear the answer. But um, the worst thing is when there's somebody that just won't play by the rules, you know? People are nice to put up with people like me that have no coordination or skill but still want to play. <laughs> uh, serving the youth group here, I, like, I was always the last one to be picked for teams. Like, I see this little, you know, fifth grade girl waddling by. I'm like, really, guys? <laughs> So God keeps us humble one way or another, right? But um, we have to compete like an athlete who plays fair. And again, think of the imagery. There was this massive stadium and all the gymnasiums in town. And gymnasiums were a big deal to the Romans. They worshiped the human body, basically, right? And so there was a lot of strength training and a lot of... uh, They had a whole plethora of games that we don't even play anymore. You see some of them when the Olympics roll around. But they were just... They took their sport seriously. They really did. And um, so he's saying, you got to play fair. you got to play by the rules, Timothy. Um, I think of recent examples where there's backlash in our culture because athletes weren't playing by the rules. There was deflate gate. Remember that? The Patriots and Belichick and all that mess. Then there was the Houston Astros, um, victories of shame, right? Cheating their way to the top. Or the dubious victory of that recent uh, Olympics uh, just this past year where there's medalists that were playing for the, not for Russia, but for the, what was it called? There's some like little other name for it because Russia was banned for the Olympics for doping, but their people still played. And anyway, so they're meddling, right? And the U.S. folks who meddled in some of the same events were saying, yeah, it's good to have a victory, but it doesn't feel as much like a victory because, you know, I got bronze to uh, someone who got a gold who was probably doping. We don't like it when people don't play by the rules. And so let's turn to 1 Corinthians one twenty six on that point. And Paul's message here is, true athletes cannot cut corners and expect to win in the long run. We can't cut corners. And 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians... 126. I'm in the wrong book here. For you see your calling, brethren, not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the things of the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world. The things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. So I love the way the Lord works. He flips the rules on their head. And he says, you got to play by the rules, Timothy, but remember that what the rules are, that we are the weak and the foolish of this world, and it's okay. We may feel like we are the base things of this world, that we do not have the skill, education, background, or, or credentials of many others, but that's not the rules in my kingdom. In my kingdom, I choose those things to make fools of those things that are riding on human arrogance and pride. I choose the simple, weak, foolish things to make a testimony and name for myself and to actually reveal God himself to the world. 
And so he's saying play by the rules, but I think it's important we know what the rules are. God's economy is so different than ours. Man looks on the outward appearance, but where does God look? He looks on the heart. Amen. So he's saying play by the rules. Stay weak. Stay foolish in the things of the world. Stay humble. Play by the rules. And the other thing that we need to think of is what are, I mean, the most famous rules ever given are the Ten Commandments. Amen. We can't come to the point where we think we're somehow above the rules. In any way, shape, or form, those, that will be compromised. That's pride that, that costs Satan heaven. And it could very well do the same for us. Amen? And so what we need to do is be sure that we play by the rules. He gives a third analogy here, metaphor. Verse 6, he says, The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Diligence, diligence, diligence. Paul talked a lot about diligence. He reminds me of Pastor Ritt in that way. <laughs> Pastor Ritt can't stand laziness. He'll tell you that, right? And I remember one time, um, the story, and a lot of you may remember it, but when uh, we had Bethesda House, uh, it was a rehab home that was run by the chapel. And uh, he went over there to pick up a load of guys who were there, you know, as part of, who were residents of the rehab program, and he was going to take them on a work day. And one of the guys was missing when he was doing the head count, and they loaded up the vehicle, and he said, where's so-and-so? And they're like, well, he's, he's in bed sick. Like, he's like, what's wrong with him? You know, of course, you know, <laughs> specifies, you know, let's get specific. What do you mean by sick? He's like, what's wrong with him? And he said, there's something wrong with his belly button. <laughs> and for any of you who know Pastor Ritt, it's bad enough to make some kind of excuse to get out of work, but your belly button, right? <laughs> And so, of course, Pastor Ritt, like, it was just a, it wasn't a matter, it was just a matter of time until he was uh, at that guy's bedside, pulling him out of bed with the fear of God. <laughs> I think his belly button was miraculously healed in an instant. <laughs> but um, diligence is important, right? Laziness will undercut our testimony every single time, whether it's spiritual, physical, natural. Um, men, I think that... Um, I think the laziness of our sex has led to the demise of our culture. And, you know, that's something that Pastor Ritt has definitely ingrained within us as we've been brought up in him. But, um, you know, I, I know of marriages that have failed because the 40-year-old husband was addicted to video games, you know, and his two teenage sons were left to his wife to raise. And she walked away from the marriage. She said, I... I can't raise you, you know? And so that's just one snapshot of the laziness that can easily come in. I, I, um, not to say it's only for us guys, but I can be harsh on our sex, I think, because um, I think it is one of the bigger um, pitfalls that Satan has for us. So he's saying here, make sure you don't become lazy. Don't become slack in, in doing what God's called you to do. A f how long does a lazy farmer last? Not long. Everything is up to him, right? If, if those seeds aren't planted and watered and nourished and the weeds aren't taken care of and the fertilizer doesn't happen and uh, a whole list of things, you know, his whole livelihood and family is at risk. And so he's saying, follow the farmers. They, they get up early. They work late. They, they, they go out in all conditions. There's, no, there's never a question in their mind whether or not they're going to do what they need to do today. Um, they're programmed to do what is necessary every day that they breathe because everything depends on it. And so, he's saying, be a good farmer. In 1 Corinthians 3, we won't turn there for time's sake, but um, Paul, in another letter, makes it clear that some plant, some water, you know, some sow the seeds, some are called to water the seeds, some are called to cultivate the, the uh, crops, and some are called to bring in the harvest. So don't be discouraged if you're in a calling or a, even a season of your calling that has you doing 100% seed sowing and you never see the harvest, that's fine. Keep doing what you're doing because we do have different parts of that farmer life in the spirit. And sowing seeds just basically means putting the truth out there, putting the love of Jesus out there, making sure that you're a faithful testimony to whoever's in your life, and then letting God bring the harvest. Um, he tells him, be diligent farmer. And 
I think that farmers are the, one of the best examples of faith, too. Take a little kernel of, of grain or, or corn or whatever it may be, a little seed, put it in the ground. I mean, if you think about it, if you remove all the, the knowledge of science that we have about that, right? It's like, what is that guy doing? <laughs> you know, putting his little seeds in the ground. But we know what he's doing, and we know what comes next. Through the miracle of growth, you know, the Lord transforms that seed into so much more. So through the miracle of the Spirit, the seeds that we sow and the seeds that we receive into our own hearts from the Lord grow by the power of the Holy Spirit into so much more than we ever imagined. So he's saying operate with that kind of faith, faith that knows there will be a harvest even when all you see is seeds and dirt. So we see here the three metaphors. Be a good soldier that, that suffers well, that soldiers on through difficulty and hardship. Be a good athlete who plays by the rules and stays humble to those rules. And be a hardworking farmer because you want to be first to partake of those crops in your life. Then he closes the letter. Excuse me, he closes this passage in the letter with verse 7. Consider what I say. And may the Lord give you understanding in all things. In 1 Corinthians 2, Paul tells us that we have the mind of Christ once we are his, once we're bought by his, his blood and purchased by him. He gives us his wisdom. And he says, pray over everything I said. Don't feel like you have to stressfully apply every literal word to every situation and mathematically figure out how to fit this formula onto your daily ministry decisions. No, he's saying... Take what I'm saying as true, but let the Holy Spirit apply it in the ways and the timing that he sees fit. Um, and that's what I love about the Word of God. You remember, we revere this as the absolute inerrant truth of God, fully inspired, right? We, however, do not worship this. This points us to the one who is alone worthy of our worship and adoration, Jesus himself. We proclaim the gospel Absolutely, and we live for it, as I said earlier. But the gospel is not what we worship. We worship Jesus himself. And so what he's saying is, take all this and take it to the Father. Let the Holy Spirit speak wisdom to you in applying everything that, that I've told you here. Turn with me a couple pages to 2 Timothy 4. Same book, just a couple chapters over. We're going to see these three metaphors again. Look in verse 7 with me. I have fought the good fight, Paul says. I've been a good soldier. I've done what I'm telling you to do, Timothy. I have fought the good fight. I have soldiered on through some amazing hardships. I have finished the race. I have been the athlete who played by the rules. Once the Lord gripped me with his truth and converted me out of my lostness, I played by the rules that he gave me. I lived for him and not for me. His, his instructions alone are what mattered. And though I'm, though I'm flawed and human, I did play by the rules in every chance that, I, that he made them plain to me. And then he says, I have kept the faith. I have been that diligent farmer. I have operated in faith that what, everything that God calls me to do, to till the land, to plant seeds, to cultivate and bring a harvest, I've done my part in faith. And I've not lost the faith. And there's no need for you to either. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. He's saying, look for Jesus, Timothy. Think over everything I've said. Take it to the Lord. And keep in mind, I'm not giving you some idle instructions from this distant height. I'm down in the trenches with you. And I'm telling you as one who survived the trenches and who's got, and who's God's grace has 
sufficiently supplied everything I've needed. I'm saying he will do the same for you. That grace that was sufficient for me and my weakness and temptation and lack and, and near-death experiences and everything that I went through, the same grace will carry you. You will be a good soldier, faithful athlete, and a diligent farmer if you just follow Jesus and let him propel you forward. One of the things that we fear, if we're honest, is failure, is it not? And I'll tell you, as, as ministers of the gospel, those of us who are called to, to pulpits in some capacity, all the press goes to all the failures, doesn't it? And there have been many and mighty failures. But I dare say, There are many, many cloud of witnesses, faithful laborers going on year after year after year and who have been faithful to their call. And we can join their throng and we can ignore the bad press in terms of discouragement, but let it keep us humble that we are all one step away from failure if we lean on our own strength. But he's saying, you can be a faithful man, Timothy. As sons of God, as daughters of God, what we crave more than anything is just to be faithful to him who loves us so. Amen? Well, let me encourage you. The gospel paves a pathway from the point of being called, being saved into his kingdom, all the way to receiving the crown of righteousness that is laid up for you and me. His gospel will propel us forward and keep us and transform us and educate us. And that's where I want to turn for our last scripture this morning, John chapter 14. John chapter 14. We spoke, those of you who are with us Wednesday night, we spoke about the Last Supper, right? In the context of the psalm that we studied was Jesus' Last Supper, the Passover meal he had with his disciples. And um, that's where we are in this passage. It's, he's sharing these three chapters are just him pouring out his heart to his disciples and then to his father, the last, Jesus' last words, we could say, before his crucifixion. And what do we learn from his last words to his disciples? Verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments, play by the rules. Verse 16, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. So the encouragement to us is this, as as Paul told Timothy you know, ponder, consider, pray over everything I've just shared with you about how to be faithful. And the Lord will give you understanding. My encouragement to you this morning is the same. Pray over everything the Lord is speaking to your heart and mind. Pray over everything that you learn from his word. The Lord will give you understanding because we are not orphans. We're not dependent upon words from a pulpit. We're not dependent upon words of any other man or woman. We're only dependent upon Jesus himself. And he sends his Holy Spirit into our lives and in a sweet way, he, he takes over. He takes over everything that we let him take over. And as he does, he shows us truth. He teaches us. Remain like an ignorant child that you may learn at the foot of the master. Amen. So faithfulness, brothers and sisters, it is our choice. But it's God's accomplishment. It requires embracing suffering, playing by the rules, and a lot of hard work. But we are empowered by his grace and led by his spirit to do just that. And as Pastor Dave comes up for our closing song, I wanted to um, ask you this morning, what do you hear in Paul's last words? As his challenge to faithfulness to his protege, Timothy. Oh, and... P.S. Timothy obeyed. He was faithful. How do we know? 
Because in John's, as John penned the book of Revelation, there's messages to the churches. And one of the messages which to the church at Ephesus, which was the one that Timothy pastored, and they remained faithful to the doctrine. Had they wandered from the heart of it all a little bit? Yeah. And God challenged them on that. But he was, had such dedication to do what these two letters instructed him to do, to remain faithful to the doctrine of the gospel itself. So faithfulness was his legacy and his testimony, and Pastor Timothy's as well. And so let, let, the, let the strong testimony, let the ending well that Paul and Timothy both experienced encourage you this morning. And whatever the Lord is speaking to you, you may feel that you are a, sol- you are a soldier. You may feel you're in the conflict. And there's an old song that said, deep inside this armor, the warrior is a child. Yeah. People don't see behind the armor, but the Lord sees. And it's okay to be that child with tears behind the armor, but know that he's there with you and know that he will give you the victory. Identify the greatest hindrance in your life to embracing suffering, to embracing a gospel-centered lifestyle, to embracing the Lordship of Christ for you personally. What is standing in the way? Brothers and sisters, stop playing games with the Holy Spirit if you are. There's no time for games. I'm haunted and encouraged by two passages. That mercy does triumph over judgment. But the judgment does begin at the house of God. So let it be sobering for us. That there's no time for game playing. We've got to surrender or stop pretending. As we commemorate that tragedy, as John Michael said, 3,000 lives were lost, and that was initially. Thousands have died from the inhalation of the carbons um, in New York specifically since then. 3,000 died that tragic day of September 11th. By some estimates, 660,000 have died in our country from COVID-19. How many people have to die? How much judgment has to be evident in our country, in our culture, for us to get the point? And I say us, the church. I'm not talking about the lost world. I'm talking about us. Let's not miss the point in all this. Amen? And so, as we close, what will your last words be? What will your legacy be? I believe with you and for you that it will be faithfulness. Because we have a God who calls us and a God who keeps those he calls. Amen. And so move forward today. Soldier on as a good soldier. Play by the rules as a good athlete. And keep the faith like a good farmer. And you will see the crown of righteousness laid up for you. Amen. 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 Let's stand together for song.